You're listening to The Great Simplification with Nate Hagens. That's me. On this show, we try to explore and simplify what's happening with energy, the economy, the environment, and our society. Together with scientists, experts, and leaders, this show is about understanding the bird's eye view of how everything fits together, where we go from here, and what we can do about it as a society and as individuals. Gerardo Ceballos is a well-known ecologist and conservationist working on animal population ecology. He is world-renowned for his influential work on global patterns of distribution of diversity and extinction risk in vertebrates. Gerardo and I have a wide-ranging discussion about animal populations, the sixth mass extinction, his new project called Creatures United, and how we can better care about and protect Earth's remaining biodiversity. This conversation got kind of intense at times. Well, because the subject matter is so important, what's happening is so tragic and is so little regarded in our national discourse. I hope you listen and learn from my conversation with Professor Gerardo Ceballos, and perhaps it will change how you think about the natural world in some small way. Okay, my friend, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, You have written numerous books and are a very heavily cited ecologist. Your books range from Mammals of Mexico to the Annihilation of Nature. And we're going to talk a lot about this. But first, I would ask you, how did you first get interested personally in studying animals and animal populations? Well, as far as I know, my parents say that since I was very, very little, I used to say that I was going to study animals. I didn't know that it was uh, biology. But then when I was like 12, 13 years old, I got a book. They were like tiny books. And I got one. It's called The Last Schema. And it was the story of the Schema curlew, who was once the most uh, uh, abundant species on the planet. And it was a novel written in 1954 and basically talks about the last two uh, curlews who will refrain from Patagonia in Argentina to the Arctic. And one was killed, the female, and the male continued the flight. It was uh, the longest, one of the longest migrations in the planet. And he spent the whole summer singing for females and nobody shows up. And uh, I got full of anxiety thinking that I could go to the streets in my city and another city, another city without finding another human being. And at that point, I decided that what I wanted to do is to save a species from extinction. And then at a high school, one of my teachers taught me that it was ecology and so on. But basically, it was a, that was the, the origin of uh, my interest in uh, extinction and animals and so on. So you started with your heart and then your head followed. That's exactly right. And I think I, I'm still, a lot of what I do is from my heart. And then I just frame it in terms of the science to be able to make it uh, available to everybody. Okay. So, Gerardo, today, how many species exist on Earth other than humans? And, and how do we know this? Well, that's a very interesting question. We know so far that around 2 million species has been described since uh, 1758, when Linneo created a system for classifying animals and plants and uh, organisms on the planet. But what is very, very interesting is that the estimates, the current estimates of how many species are in the planet, range from 50 million to several billions. But just if we take the most conservative thing, that we estimate that there are around 50 million species of plants, animals, and microorganisms in the planet, and we have described only 2 million, that it means that most, most of all the uh, biodiversity in the planet is unknown to science. And this is not surprising, though, then, that every year more than 18,000 species are scientifically described. And in terms of mammals, uh, there are not only rodent or small animals, they include big animals like whales. Last year, uh, two new whales were uh, found in the waters of the U.S. and Mexico. And since 2000, 
uh, more than 80 species of uh, monkeys has been described. In 2017, a whole new species of orangutan was found in uh, Sumatra. So the wealth of the biodiversity in the planet is really unbelievable, it's amazing. And what is unfortunate is most of the species are unknown to us. It almost feels paradoxical that soon after discovering some of these species, they might go extinct, <laughs> you know, in some of these cases. In many cases, for, for instance, one of the most interesting stories is that the stellar sea cow, it was described 27 years after it was found in the 1700s in uh, the Bering Islands. And it was found actually by the Bering Expedition, Vitus Bering Expedition to uh, Alaska and this area in Russia. And they collected and after it became extinct, it was described. And there are species like the Saola that is the, the largest uh, uh, 100 kilogram, 250 pound animal, antelope-like animal who was described in Vietnam in 2006, something like that, and it is uh, most likely extinct now. So many of those species are at the brink of extinction when they are discovered by science. So I don't think you can um, definitively answer this, but the number of species alive today as a conservation biologist, how would you estimate that versus 10,000 years ago or even longer ago than that? The same, more or less? Well, the most important part of this is, like right now, we have the highest number of species in the last 700 million years in the planet. We are in the pinnacle of a species diversity. And this is well established because we know how many species have been accumulated. And remember that evolution is a, a trade-off between extinction and speciation. And basically, during normal times, there are more species evolving than species becoming extinct. And we know now that there are more species than in the last 700 million years. We also know now that unfortunately in the last 10,000 years, we have lost a great deal of species, but also population and also of individuals of those species. We don't know exactly how many, because if we don't know how many there are, how can we know how many that have become extinct? But we have good uh, grasp for what has happened in the last, let's say, 100 years in terms of what have we lost. Well, I know most people in the United States, we have this fascination with dinosaurs and Tyrannosaurus rex and Brontosaurus, and they lived 70 million years ago. And most people don't realize that North America was a veritable Serengeti like 20,000 years ago, where we had five species of giant cats and beavers the size of a Volkswagen and, you know, uh, woolly mammoths and like unbelievable biodiversity not that long ago. Well, I mean, this is uh, what we know the, the Pleistocene extinction. In the Pleistocene is the last two million years. In the less, uh, late Pleistocene, let's say 18,000, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, uh, a lot of the species, uh, big species, become extinct in the planet. And this is a combination of a couple of things. Changes in the climate in the planet. Remember that in the maximum glacial, uh, 18,000 years ago, there were around three kilometers of ice on Kansas, just to give us an idea how different was the planet. But at that time, uh, when humans start to disperse from Africa, uh, they start to exterminate uh, some of the larger species. There were still some mammoths alive, something like 4,000 years ago in some of the islands in Alaska and in this region. So in the last uh, few thousand years, humans, we were able to exterminate most of the larger animals, like mammoths, mastodons, and so on, many of them directly, and many of them because we destroyed the prey of the large carnivores, as those carnivores uh, eventually succumb to uh, the lack of food, to the changes in the climate, and to human exploitation. Fast forward to today, how many roughly vertebrate animals with a backbone, how many vertebrate species are there on the planet? Well, vertebrates, we mean by vertebrates, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes are basically around 40,000, 45,000 species in the planet. Out of 50 million or so. 
out of the 2 million species that we know, around 45,000 are vertebrates. Okay. And uh, many, many more are still undescribed, and, but we don't really know how many will be uh, at the end uh, accounted for. Just let me tell you that if we maintain the pace of describing a species like we have been doing since 1758, they will take a few thousand years to complete the description of all these species. So it is impossible that we will know how many species and what are those species in the planet. That right there, what you just stated is one of my greatest wishes of all time, that 2000 years from now, we are still cataloging Earth species. No, that will be wonderful because if in 2000 years or 3000 years, we will be still be cataloging a species, it will be great for two reasons. One, we will still be here, humans. Humanity will be still in the planet. And second, it will mean that our activities has an, it didn't impact so much the planet. So many of those species will be still be alive at that time. Well, we're going to get into the factors that that influence that. But first, let me just ask you a personal question. Do you have a favorite animal or a favorite vertebrate? Well, yes, I work with uh, jaguars and bison and many animals. But I think uh, perhaps my most preferred animal are flying squirrels. Mm. We have those here in Wisconsin. Yes, I know. And we have them here in Mexico. I discovered them in central Mexico many years ago. And they are so unique, so beautiful that I become really in love with flying squirrels. Most people think I prefer jaguars or something like that. I love them, but I really like flying squirrels. You're at some property in your hometown there in Mexico, right? Is there is there nature and wildlife there or are you in a big city? I live in a city. It's a big city, but the, around the city there is still a lot of forest. And I have a ranch close by that is uh, basically just in the middle of a forest. And we have a lot of wildlife there. Do you have a wildlife camera where you go and see what ran by in the night? I have a couple here and I love it. Definitely. That's one of my passions. One of my passions is to uh, photograph wildlife. And I travel with my family and I have forced them to go with me to Africa, Asia, to so many places to take photographs of animals. Yeah, I've been really fortunate to go to Africa several times. I would have to say my favorite animal is the Cape hunting dog. And I've seen three packs of them live in my life on, on three different trips. So I love wild animals. You're very lucky. Yeah, I know I'm lucky. I, I mean, my story, just briefly, my parents moved around a lot when I was a kid. And my mom always took me to zoos when we were in cities. And I would sit in the front seat of the car and scan the horizon for animals, even when I was three years old. So whatever it is, uh, that's what motivated me. I think it's a curse and it's, it's a blessing. Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, Gerardo, that's what's sacred to me is the animals that we share the planet with. And I question how our culture is stressed with economic and poverty and political things. Could we ever have a cultural consciousness where we recognize the species that we haven't even described yet and we're changing their ecosystems? Could that ever be like primary in people's heads. I know it is in yours and many of the people that we have as friends, but could that ever be a, a cultural a calling? I, I don't know. No, I definitely don't know. I see some good signs that were going in the right direction, but I see so many bad signs that were really in a bad direction. Just in Mexico right now, the Mexican president is uh, investing a lot in fossil fuel. I mean, who in his right mind he will be investing in fossil fuels. And he was mocking the other day the U.S. because somebody in the U.S. said that, say that they were investing in electric cars. And he said, oh, come on, why do you invest in electric cars? And this is the, the president of, of the one, Mexico, which is like the 11th economy of the planet, you know? Let me tell you that people ask me a lot of time why I don't, if I, I am interested in people, in saving other people and so on. And of course I am. But to be honest, I mean, my major quest in life is to save as many species of plants and animals from extinction. I know that uh, if we manage to infect other people with this idea, these species are our companions. These species have been with us since our first ancestors three million years ago start to walk through evolution towards what we are now. 
uh, those companions, those species, plants, animals who have who has been with us along this journey, it was worth destroying. It was worth killing. It was worth directly or indirectly destroying with our activities. And for me, that really makes me uh, wonder if we don't have any sensibility to understand that what hope we have for humanity if we don't even know how to treat those species who have been working with us. Do you think it's more that we don't care or that we don't know or some combination? Well, definitely it's a combination of uh, that we don't care because we don't know, but sometimes we know and we don't care because the society, we have been moving to that idea that to, to having wealth, to accumulate things and so on is better than anything else. And most of the young people here in Mexico or throughout the world are feeling that they are a failure if they don't have a house or two houses or three houses and a car huh? when they are 20, 22, 23 years old. Many of them, I mean, I see so many young people who don't have grown so detached from nature, from understanding the value, the beauty of all these uh, manifestations of life. I wonder if we ever want to change. And I have seen that this has become even worse with the advance of, of uh, technology, with cell phones and tablets and so on. I mean, most of these uh, children never go out to play. And it, it really it makes me wonder if we're going to win this battle with this, all the technology and all these stimulus, taking the people, children, young adults and adults away from what really matters in terms of uh, the environment. Because you can get the same neurochemicals from a phone that you could from going on a bird watching trip in the forests, even though it's a total false representation of it, you can get the same stimulation from games and pictures of animals where it's a lot of effort to go into the woods. And so our brains can be hijacked by technology when the real thing is just out there. It definitely that they're, they're being hijacked. And you're right that our brains, the same regions of the brain that are stimulated by alcohol, by drugs, or by pleasure of different kinds of things, or by entertainment, are being moved by these video games and so on. But let me tell you, when I was young, when we were kids, we didn't have to go out far away. We would go out outside in the garden and play there with the dirt and with the stone and rocks. And I mean, I understand that uh, sometimes it may take a lot of effort to go out away, but uh, I don't know, when you were a kid, we just go out anywhere sometimes to the forest and sometimes to our garden, some, sometimes even to the streets. And uh, we have a wonderful time having the same kind of, of uh, uh, stimulation that they have now with the, this fake stimulation with their cell phones and so on. We were blessed, Gerardo. We were blessed with that. When I grew up, when I was in uh, grade school, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I would come home from school every day, get my dog, and we would go into the foothills of the Siskiyou Mountains in southern Oregon, and I would just explore for three hours till dinner time, looking at trees and finding salamanders every day. That's what I did, looking at deer and other things. I always I knew there was a small, small, small chance there would be a mountain lion out there. And that's like what made it really exciting. Uh, there was a movie called Citizen Kane where Rosebud was his sled that he longed for his childhood. That sort of experience in the natural world, kind of carefree, is is my rosebud. And that's perhaps why we're friends and we're having this conversation. It is so interesting because when I was a junior level, we lived close to Toluca. This, this city is called Toluca, and I was very deep, but at that time it was small. And just next to my house, there was a lake. And I will spend, I will go home, have a lunch, Mexico lunch around two, three in the afternoon, and then go to this place. And until my parents will have to come to look at for me at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night when it was really dark, because I will be, it was so addictive that I will spend day and day and day looking for salamanders, as you say, snakes and raccoons and bats and so on. Those was the years that really formed me as a naturalist. I wrote my first paper that obviously was a kind of a really bad in the sense, but it was like a natural history paper on the natural history of the water snakes on that lake. Because I will remember and I will write down what, the, what were they doing in the spring and the summer 
and, and the uh, winter and so on. Sometimes I will see what they were feeding on, who was preying upon them and so on. And I managed to write something like a 10 page uh, thing that I, so it was my first paper. My parents will used to laugh and say, yeah, this is uh, so weird, my, my kids are so, it's so weird. Uh, but they were very supportive. And as you say, we are incredibly lucky that we have that. And this is what we, I try to give to my children. We, they were able to go. And let me tell you this story. We used to go to Africa and those places. And I will used to say, okay, we go to Disneyland and then we go to the Everglades. So we go to this place in Europe and then we go to Africa. And then one day my 16 year old, since he was he, becoming a teenager, he said, oh, where are we going this year to college? And I explained the places we were going to Africa. And I said, do I have to go? And I said, mm. no, you don't, you don't have to. And I left him and we left. We were. And then three years or four years afterward, he said, Dad, when are we going to Africa? And I said, why? He said, because I'm dying for Africa. It was amazing. I mean, he managed to understand the value, the beauty of all of this, you know, after passing his teenager years. And they love, they don't do science and they don't, well, they do, one of them is a scientist, mathematician, the lady, and the other guy is in finance. But both of them really love nature and they, both of them really are balanced on understanding the value of having this education. Well, building on that, and I want to make sure I have a lot of questions for you about your research and your prognosis. But is it possible that we growing up in affluent countries are privileged to care about the environment like we do, and that most recent generations and many places on the earth today are just concerned with making a living and how they're going to feed their families this weekend, and they don't see the environment from a bird's eye view the way that you and I are discussing it. So is the environmental concern the way that you and I see it, is that a privilege of this fossil fuel bonanza period that we're going through? Well, it is a privilege, but it's not a privilege only of the people who is more affluent. I work a lot with people, uh, local people here in Mexico. Sometimes they are the owners of large tract of forests, tropical forests in southern Mexico. And what I find is incredible. They obviously are not rich at all. They uh, really uh, sometimes are have difficult times to feed. And most of the time when we go there and help them to find ways so they can protect the forest while making some money or by protecting it, it is incredible how much love, how much pride, how much attachment they have to nature. So, I, I mean, we have been people, for instance, calling me say, okay, we have uh, two cows and they were killed by a jaguar. And I said, I'm so sorry. And I said, what do you want to do? He said, well, we don't want to kill the jaguar. Is there any way you can help us to pay a little bit or something for those animals that we can uh, recover a little bit of our losses? And I said, you don't want to kill the jaguar? He said, no, no, we don't want to kill the jaguar. We basically are invading their land. And this is a story that happens time after time after time. What we are lucky in the planet is the people, poor or richer or uh, in between, who has the possibilities to enjoy nature for whatever reason. In some cases, it's because they live next door to nature, although they don't have a lot of money. And sometimes people more affluent with us who can maybe live far away from nature, but we can go rather often because we have the means. So this takes me to the point that it's not determined if you are going to care for nature or not, if you have a lot of money or not. Do you think that we have some sort of evolutionary relationship with nature and affinity, like E.O. Wilson referred to it as biophilia? Is there something that is irrespective of our current uh, modern consumer culture that is, is ingrained with us, our relationship to nature? What do you think about that? I think definitely we have some grain, this relationship with nature, with animals. And it can be, for instance, most of the, I mean, when the small children are afraid of darkness. And I think this is a manifestation of our uh, recent past, where if you were not afraid of darkness, you will go crawl out of the house and you will be eaten by a hyena or a bite by a snake or whatever. And the same thing, I mean, most of the people that I know even if they have lived in, in the city, once you take them to a park or once you take them to a forest, 
I would say probably 99% of them, they will enjoy it and they will feel so quiet, so calm. So definitely we have evolved in nature and the forests, the lakes, the animals, the plants, well, plants and animals are part of our evolution. Uh, many, many human beings are still part of that. I mean, I don't know of the uh, 8 billion people, but I, I don't know, maybe two or three billion, but probably more are still in close contact to nature. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, being bombarded by these ideas that having wealth is what it counts, is uh, causing a, a lot of problems. But if we think that we have this link, that's something that we need to exploit towards trying to get conscience at the global scale for saving the biodiversity. Well, like you, I'm a scientist and I have a scientific mind, so I can't explain what I'm about to tell you. But my first time in Africa, I went with my dad. He was uh, on a hunting trip and I just went when I was 21 years old to take pictures. And I felt this affinity like I was coming home or something like that. It was like this primal feeling of connectedness that first, you know, couple days in Botswana at that time, it was a really odd sensation, but I just so loved it. I will never forget it. Oh, that's very interesting because my kids and us, when they were the first time in Africa, we were crossing the Serengeti and we spent like 15 days there. And I remember, I don't know which one of them said one, one afternoon, Wow, this is so beautiful. It feels like home. I mean, exactly in the same in the same feeling that you described. He was sitting down on the on on the jeep, looking at the horizon, and it feels like home. It's not our home. It's our it's where we come from. And yeah. definitely there is that, that affinity. Okay, so with that entree, let's get into your work, sir. You recently wrote, co-wrote a paper underestimating the challenges of avoiding a ghastly future, which cataloged a lot of risks to biodiversity, species, ecosystems. Could you just give us an overview of, of your general findings, either in that paper or generally, you know, what percent of natural ecosystems have been lost in the last 50 years, animals, etc.? Well, I think uh, one of the most important uh, contributions I have uh, done in science has been to try to understand what is the magnitude of extinction crisis. And I was fortunate to go to Stanford to do a sabbatical and meet uh, Paul Ehrlich. And talking to him, uh, I developed these ideas. And I wrote the first paper on extinctions, uh, species extinction in Mexico in 1992, something like that, when there was the first president in Mexico who was very neoliberal. And at that time, I thought I wrote that being so neoliberal could be really good if we will take care of uh, the important thing of the environment, but also could be the tipping point to make uh, humanity in really bad shape. And then I went to Stanford and I got exposed to so many people and so many ideas. And then one of the first questions that I wanted to answer is, at that time, many people would think that extinction was bad, but it was part of evolution. Let's remember that evolution worked with extinctions and speciation, and, and that's the basic, one of the basic processes of evolution. Working there, first of all, I was uh, one day listening to, to Paul Ehrlich talking about population extinction, and it occurred to me that that was one of the critical points. We, we were not understanding the magnitude of extinction because we were looking at the species that become extinct. It's like if you go and see the problem of a big pandemic like they were having now, just counting the people who died. Obviously, this is just a, the final end and a tiny part of the whole problem. So at that time, I wrote a paper with Paul Ehrlich on what we call, we evaluate for the first time, what was the extinction, the magnitude of population extinctions in a whole group in the planet, in this case, mammals. We were able to, uh, to gather a database with the distributions of species in the 1900 and the current distribution. That was around 2000. And what we saw is a um, brutal, literally a brutal destruction of populations of many species. The range was like a very big range, 100% was contracted to 20, 15, 50%. So uh, the range contraction obviously implicate 
the, the losing the populations. That was the first time I, I could see that the magnitude of what we were doing to the uh, uh, planet in term, uh, biodiversity in terms of uh, the extinction was really big. So you're saying that if you just count the extinctions like the dodo bird or the Tasmanian tiger, that you're actually underestimating the magnitude because there's a difference between population extinction and species extinction. Definitely. That's definitely very important. Let me give you an example. If we have jaguars in Mexico, it doesn't matter if they become extinct here, if there are jaguars in Brazil, in terms of the role and function they play in ecosystems and in the provision of environmental services. That is all the benefit that we get from nature. So disappearance of populations are basically like extinctions, called extinction. Is that is that what's called an ecological extinction? Yeah, it's an ecological extinction. It is similar. Ecological extinction is when you have a species, you know, in an area. Uh, uh, let, let's say, first of all, population extinction, all species are made up by several populations. And when you the species become extinct, we had lost all the populations. But those populations at the local and regional level, you know, are so important that then when you lose them, you lose the value and it's like it was a whole extinction. Can you give an example of one of those species and that that happened? No, well, just as I said, the elephants. You see the distribution of the elephants. They were just at the beginning of this uh, century, almost one million elephants. 20, 20 years ago. 30 years ago, they were yeah. one, something one million. Years. And now there are 250,000 elephants. In the whole world? In the whole world, in whole Africa. So if you see the, the map of the distribution, you will see an area, most of Africa will be covered by the distribution of elephants. Now you will see just dots, dots in the, in the continent, a small population dispersed throughout the continent. So it means that we have lost elephants in most of Africa. And by losing them, we have lost the role, what they do. And there are many roles that the elephants have. And let me give you two examples. On the one hand, for instance, they disperse lots of uh, plants that they eat and then maintain the savanna because they destroy trees to eat the bark. So the savannas, when you lose the elephants, are invaded by uh, scrubs and trees and eventually you lose the savanna and you lose the grasslands with so many animals. So the elephants are critical to maintain the savanna. But recently, other scientists have shown that when you lose the elephants and other ungulates and other species of larger mammals that feed on plants, the grasses grow much larger. And on those grasses, the populations of many rodents exploit, become very abundant. And those rodents has many diseases that affect humans. So by losing the elephants, you're losing the composition of the plants. And then this is causing a massive increase of rodents. And those rodents transmit diseases to uh, humans, to domestic animals, and to wildlife. So who will think that the elephant, the presence of the elephant, will be linked to the presence and the abundance of rodents in Africa. A conservation biologist might think that, but you're right. We don't normally think in terms of systems. There is that story, I don't know how true it is, about the elk and the wolves and the ecosystems in the Yellowstone, S similar sort of thing. It's very similar, and it's part, it is basically correct. So in the case of the elephants, just to um, highlight that, what are the main reasons that we've gone from a million down to 250,000 in the last 25 years? Well, basically, it's uh, poaching. And we are losing habitat. They're losing habitat more. Uh, as more humans, uh, there are more human population, we need more food. So more habitat of the elephant is being destroyed to plant crops. But basically, the main problem is we're still killing elephants for uh, their ivory. Just to give you an idea, 15 years ago, an elephant was being killed. Every 15 minutes, an elephant was illegally killed. Even now, an elephant is being killed every 40 minutes illegally to take their dust, tusks to the markets, especially in China. And what is really incredibly surprising is that the uh, tusks are useless. They, are, they use them for ornamentals and for some crafts 
but we're killing the elephants because this huge appetite for ivory. And now the, the mafias in China and in Africa and Mexico, everywhere in the US, the mafias dealing with the trade of animals and in this, in this specific case of uh, African elephants have more power, more money, more guns than the guards and many times that the local governments. It's a real, real bad problem. I had another guest, I don't know if you know paleobiologist Peter Ward, uh, but he yeah. told me that there's some alternatives to ivory and now all of a sudden deep coral reefs are being unearthed because they're taking giant clams as a replacement for ivory, that there's a, a big demand for giant clams. Uh, because they're starting to change the the demand away from ivory a little bit. I don't know the details of the story, but... Well, the problem is, who needs ivory? I, right. I mean, who could live without ivory? And the Well, who needs three houses? Exactly. I mean, the pandemic is related to the trade of animals in China and Southeast Asia. The pangolins. The pangolins, the bats. If you put wet market in Google, you will see horrendous photographs and videos of the way the uh, domestic and wild animals are in cages in these markets in very unsanitary conditions. So it's very easy from the wild animal, a disease, jump to a domestic animal, so to humans. So to be honest, it is the time, it is now the right time to stop, to try to stop the illegal trade of animals. Although saying it's easy, but the legal trade of wildlife and plants, it is so big that is, uh, in terms of money, is almost as big as uh, the drugs, the drug trade. Well, it's it's akin to changing GDP as our cultural goal. Do yeah. we change the taxes uh, and the rules, or do we change people's aspirations? In other words, do you devote all your money to anti-poaching people with rifles and? night goggles and things like that? Or do you change the cultural demand for ivory and pangolin and all that other crazy stuff? I mean, which what's the answer? Well, I think the answer is simple in the sense that it, there is, it's impossible to have just one answer. The answer is we need to have all of this. We need to have right now goggles and people, uh, I mean, fighting to save the uh, wildlife. And we need to try to change corporations and uh, countries and the GDP. GDP. Uh, uh, in other words, this is a complex issue of a complex society, of a complex humanity. So what I'm saying is like, um, there is not simple answers, uh, but the more answers and the more solutions we have, I think the easy will be eventually to reach a society that for me is very easy. The, the, the new society coming from COVID and coming from this massive destruction that we're happening will have to have two simple elements. It should be socially more just and it will be sustainable. If you think it sounds so simple, but obviously it conveys the complexity of this, uh, of this moment of humanity. But who will, in his right mind, not think that having less poor people and having more equitable, more equal, uh, being more just with the, the poorest will be good? And who wouldn't be thinking that protecting more forests and protecting more animals and having more, better, less pollution and so on, we will be in better shape? It wasn't that long ago that black humans were treated and considered subhuman. It wasn't that long ago that women didn't have rights and couldn't vote. Is it possible that our culture will recognize what we're doing and extend some of these recognitions to other species, especially conscious self-aware species like like dolphins and bonobos and things like that i mean culturally do you think that's possible oh definitely it's possible it is very very possible as you say yes in the 1970s we have the, the the minority revolution the racial revolution the women revolution we have the sexual revolution we have the non-traditional sex preference revolution and it happens and it happened incredibly quickly 
I try to think like in the 70s or the late 1900s. In the late 1900s, the whole planet uh, event, uh, suddenly has all these new paradigms that we change completely the way we are. Uh, Marxism with Marx, and we have a, a, a evolution with, with uh, uh, Darwin. We have psychological changes with Freud, and we have Glyndor, the theology, and so on. You can, it took many years to catch up. Now, with the technology that we have, with the spread of the in the social network and the instant distribution of information, I think we have a great, great opportunity if we can use those resources with uh, the, the, these new ideas. And I see many philosophers, many scientists, many politicians, may, a, a lot of imp- an important group of uh, people talking about the right things. So I don't know if we will have enough time before we collapse. We collapse as a civilization because the damage we have done to the planet, like uh, uh, climate change, species extinction, toxification, and so on. But what I think, and probably uh, I may be wrong, but what I think is what we're experiencing right now is one of those times in the history of humanity where many things are start to change and suddenly they will change enough that they will change us to the right direction. I hope you're right about that, obviously. Let me ask you this question. Uh, you know, David Attenborough is very uh, popular and famous for his narration of, of wildlife centered shows, Planet Earth. And some of these shows are sto- so stunningly beautiful. I grew up, I used to watch religiously um, Marlon Perkins and the Mutual of Omaha's yes. Wild Kingdom. And it was like a rite of passage for my family. We would watch it, I think, Sunday nights. I would just so look forward to it. I can't watch those shows anymore, Gerardo. I can't watch planet Earth. And every once in a while, like I live on a farm here and I walk out in nature every day and I I have to do it for my mental health. But sometimes I look at the nature and I'm just struck by this dual lightning bolts. Part of it is just the awe and the beauty and the wonder of nature, but it's a bittersweet feeling because I also glimpse a fast forward ahead at what's going to happen the next century to the nature. And I feel this overwhelming sadness. And so as much as I care about these things and talking to scientists like you and, and getting the word out at some times it's too painful to, to be directly in it. Do you know what I mean? You must know what I mean. Well, yeah, I am kind of weird in that sense because uh, I have been working with extinction and we changed the paradigm and we were the first to show that the species we lost in 100, in, in 100 years we have been lost in 10,000 or more years in normal times. And I have been able to be, like I said, like the chronicles of death in, in where we say how many species are becoming extinct and so on, and, and uh, the population extinctions. And we call one of our terms, we call it the biological annihilation, because when I was uh, at the school, at the uh, high school, extinction was uh, still selective, larger animal or uh, very restricted uh, range animals and so on. But now it's a biological annihilation because basically a small or big, largely distributed or small distributed, beneficial or non-beneficial and so on, all kind of characteristics that you may have, all of those species are becoming extinct because of us. In other words, the characteristics that will make more species more prone to extinction has been wiped out by the massive assault that we have in nature. So we call it biological annihilation. And uh, I get sad and I get sometimes uh, get really down, but I really think that I have this ability and I'm glad I have it because uh, the more I feel the heat, the more I push harder to harder to harder to try to change the whole thing. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's what I'm dedicating my time on this planet to doing. And the biological annihilation of our planet species, let's be honest, yes, it's it's reaching a crescendo level, but it's been happening for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yeah. years. Every human alive in the last 500 years has witnessed part of this or it's happened sure. during their time. So since you and I have been on the planet in the late 60s, what percentage of wild animals have been lost since around 1970? This is exactly what is mind blowing because since the 1970s, we have lost around 80% of all the animals. 
What? 80% of all the animals that we used to be in this planet are being lost since 1970. So not, not the species, but the numbers of animals. Not the species, the individuals. The individuals, animals. 80% of individual animals has been lost. Individuals who were part of populations and population who were part of a species. Some of these species have become extinct. Some are, are the brink of the species. Some of those species are still uh, more or less abundant. And some of those species are abundant. But in general, all of those have lost so many individuals. Just to give you other examples, in the 19, in the 2000s, 2000 something, they published a really uh, well-researched paper where it shows that at that time, only 2% of the large species on the planet remain compared to 1960s. 2% of the charts, 2% of the tuna, 2% of any of the big fishes that were still present in the ocean. We have wiped out at that time 98% of the large fishes in the planet. And, and another example is not only the big animals and the vertebrates and so on. And, and this example are, are, are rather good and amazing good scientists from Argentina, he used to live in Mexico, was, uh, his name was Rapoport. his last name was Rapoport. And Rapoport, uh, one day he, he wrote a really nice book in Spanish where he mentioned that the changes that we were making in the planet, you could see them while driving your car. And it's that example that when you used to drive your car, there will be so many insects they splash on your windscreen, you know? And now you can drive for ages, having just one or two. I remember when I was not so long ago, I was still like 20 years old, 20 years, in Mexico, the gas station, you will stop and there will be one guy coming to clean up, you know, your windscreen and also the radiator because the radiator will have so many animals stuck by that the car could, wouldn't cool down properly the engine and then it went. So they clean up the radiator and they clean up the engine. And there was a person specifically doing that as part of the service of the gas station. That is gone because the insects are gone. So I had another one of my guests is Daniel Pauli, who came up mm -hmm. with the um, scientific concept of shifting baselines, which is that we can remember 50 years ago what the, the windshields were full of insects, but we can't look at really yesterday or the day before yesterday. Every day kind of blends into the next day. So we assume that what's happening is normal because it's happening so slowly on a day-to-day -day basis. But on a decade-to-decade -decade basis, it's tragic. But this is also part of our culture. It's part of our evolution. Remember that until very recently, we didn't have to worry about what was going to happen in three months or one year. Mm -hmm. We didn't have ways to, to store food. So we were worried about what's going to happen next, the following day. And if you were in a cave, living in a cave, and suddenly you will see smoke in the horizon, you will have to pack up your stuff because you know the other tribe or other group will come in and you will have to run. So basically we are very well developed. I mean, we have very well evolved to perceive things at the normal, uh, at every day. Oh, it's going to rain. But our rain hasn't had the capability to understand this long-term small changes on the one hand, but also remember that until 1970 something, when we f saw the first photograph of the planet on the, this massive boy, black boy, we understood it was the first time that we could see what the whole planet it is. So now for us, it is kind of easy to try to imagine what the world is, but in terms of our evolution, this kind of understanding of what's going on in the planet and that we're changing the whole planet is incredibly new. So it is incredibly difficult for us to try to first understand and then to grasp the consequences of what we're doing here in my garden in Mexico, how this is affecting the rest. It is not that because we're stupid, it's simply a mixture of cultural and biological factors. I'm realizing, Gerardo, that I could probably talk to you for four hours uh, and not cover half of what I want to ask you. So let's just cover as much as we can, because 
I have so many questions for you. Let's let's drill down on what you just said earlier. You said that elephants, the problem was um, the number of humans were encroaching on their habitat and poaching. But what about insects? Uh, what has caused the drop in insects from the people at the gas station clearing them out of your radiator and windshield to today? Well, let's put it in a larger framework if you want to. I see humans, and your guests have talked about this, is population, the, the growth of the human population, consumption, technology, and so on. Uh, has caused major environmental problems. And those problems that are global, when I grew up and was studying biology, there was only one envir global environmental problem, was glacial of the ozone layer, that fortunately we were able to solve. But then climate change, pollution, uh, toxification, invasive species, emerging and re-emerging uh, re diseases, uh, over-exploitation, habitat encroachment, habitat destruction, over killing and so on, all these massive uh, impacts of our activities, both directly and indirectly, is what is causing the destruction of plants, animals, and microorganisms. In terms of the insects, there are several theories, and I think that what is happening, it is changes regionally. In some regions, it's pesticides, in other regions, it's more climate change and so on. But what is clear is that this is happening. So, for instance, in many places, the, use, the massive use of pesticides, like in central U.S., have destroyed so many species. And for instance, um, just recently, we heard that the uh, monarch butterfly was declining. And after several studies and so on, they found different reasons for the decline. But one of them was the use of herbicides to kill uh, plant, these uh, uh, invasive plants in crops. And one of these plants is the food plant for the butterflies. So we, we kill the plants, not because we want to kill those plants, because it's just a part of the plant that you will to kill if you want to have your, your, your crop uh, free of herbs. But those particular plants are the unique food for the monarch butterflies. And when this was uh, uh, done at a continental scale, then the population collapses. Aside from that, we have in Mexico, the places where they are, where basically we're talking about no more than maybe 200 acres where those million butterflies come every year. Just imagine how fragile is the area that these 200 acres dispersed in a few million other acres can be easily be wiped out by fires, by illegal logging, and by climate change. Mm -hmm. So insects are a good example to talk about how different factors, human factors, are causing the, the destruction of a species in different scales in different parts of the planet. For elephants, a hunting could be really bad. For other species like prey dogs in Mexico, is a poisoning them because they compete with cattle and so on. It just as an aside, how many jaguars are there left in the world and how many are in Mexico, roughly? Well, roughly, for the jaguar is the most abundant of the six larger cats, uh, fortunately. There are still around 60,000 jaguars left. But 60,000 is just a fraction of the 150,000 that are estimated that there were uh, in, at the beginning of the, of the 1900s or more. Uh, in Mexico, let me tell you, this is one of the things that give me a lot of hopes. In Mexico, I, I, I organized a group which is called the Alliance for Jaguar Conservation in 2005. And we are something like 60 people from like 30, 40 different institutions and scientists and so, uh, uh, lawyers and so on, very different people. And in 2010, between 2008 and 2010, we did the first a Jaguar, national Jaguar census in any country. So we d designed a way to, to, to census the Jaguars in Mexico. And we come out with a, a 4,000 Jaguars. And 4,000 Jaguars was very good because at that time, we thought that there were 1,000 1, Jaguars no more in Mexico. So 4,000 Jaguars was a good, good news. But then we, re we repeat the census in 2019 and bingo because we have been working so hard with the government and the local communities and so on, the population grew up to 4,800 in only a, a, a around 10 years. Now we're going to do the next, next year the same, the, the third Jaguar census. But uh, so in general, we still have, we have 60, 70,000 Jaguars in the whole continent. And in Mexico, we have around 5,000. And those are good news. 
So if a species is really decimated in the population, you mentioned uh, large predatory fish are at 2%. I'm sure there's some mammals that have that level or worse, but there's still a viable population. Is there a level where they get to where the genetic diversity is so small that if they interbreed with each other, there are problems? So even though there's enough animals to breed, it, there, there's that problem. I think I read something that that's happening with cheetahs to some extent. That, that's a very good question. What you read about cheetahs, it was the idea in the 1990s or something, but the, the, uh, our understanding of genetics has become so good that uh, uh, fortunately there is not a single rule. For instance, the vaquita uh, is this uh, porpoise found in Mexico only in the Gulf of Mexico, there are probably 10 to 12. And there was a new recent study showing that this 10 to 12 have enough variability if they recover to live properly. And there are some cases like the marine elephants, who at one point there were 100 only left. And now there are more than 300,000. What? The elephant? How do you call the, the the marine elephant? Oh, the um, manatee. No, no, the elephant seal. How do you call this? Oh, uh, yeah, the, elephant seal. Okay. So it's like the elephant seal. Uh, at what point? There were only 100 left protected mm. in Mexico. This is a really interesting story. In 1920, a Mexican president declared Mexico uh, a heaven for marine animals. And that saved the great whale, saved the elephant seal, saved a lot of marine mammals. But anyway, the elephant seal, you know, there were only 100. Now there are more than 300,000. Those are the ones who goes to the coast of, of California and in the Año Nuevo Reserve. They, this is the only one, two, two, of, two colonies now. They go to the continent. Most of the time they go to islands because they were free of predators. But anyway, there are 300 animals and they have no much variability, but with the variability they have, they are doing fine. As a rule, we say that 500 animals is very critical. If you have less than 500 animals of any species, you are reaching the point where genetics and demographic factors and other factors are putting you to in really big problem. Although, as I mentioned, there is a, a lot of variability on that. And we, we just published a paper in, in 2000 to 2020, where we look at, we call this a species, the species who are at the brink of extinction. And this is coming back to what you, you mentioned on a functional extinction. We call them zombies because those species are living dead. They are still alive, but if you have 500 individuals, 100 individuals divided in several populations, basically the ecological role that you have, that you used to play is gone, but also you're facing so many demographic, genetic, population problems that are you are almost doomed to extinction unless there is an intervention by humans. So this is a, a factoid that I know well, and I think more people are becoming aware of it, but you know it cold. If you compare the approximately 8 billion humans and all of our livestock, our cows and pigs and goats and sheep, how does that compare to the number of wild animals on, on the planet? Well, that's a very good question. There have been some papers published that when I read it, it just made me really, really almost faint because they have estimate that when you took all the vertebrates of the planet, you know, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and, and you compare them to domestic animals, is 30% of the biomass of the planet is made up by the 8 billion human beings, 36%. 4% is made up by all the thousands of species of vertebrates. And the rest are domestic animals, mostly cattle and poultry. So just imagine only 4% of the total biomass of the planet is made up by wild animals. And the rest, the 96% is made up by humans and the domestic animals. So we have uh, been able to displace them. We occupied most of the land, and we have been able to take off the energy that those species uh, use. This is why it's not surprising that we have lost 80% of all the individual animals since 1970, because we basically are occupying the land and we're using 
the energy that you used to use. And if you look at, at the birds, it's even more dramatic. If you look at the 11,000 species of birds and the uh, domestic uh, 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 poultry, 70% of all the biomass is made up by domestic animals. And 30% is made up by the 11,000 wild species of birds. So it's not surprising then that we have lost 80% of all the individual animals in 1970 because we're coping their land and we are coping the energy they use. So 70% of the weight of all the birds on the planet is two species, chickens exactly. and turkeys. And the other 11,000 comprise the other 30%. Exactly. That's exactly. So I was fortunate to do an Earthwatch expedition in Ecuador. Ecuador is not much bigger than Minnesota and Wisconsin where I live, but they have, if I recall, 2,000 masomenos yeah, species yeah. of birds and the entire continental United States only has 800. So this tiny country, there are 2,000 species of birds, including 250 species of hummingbirds. That's and amazing. in the United yeah. States, we only have eight. That's amazing. So, yes, yeah, some of these places are amazing. So you were talking about the 60 minutes and so on. Well, I'll get back to that. Yeah. But I just wanted to say one other thing. We consume 70 billion chickens and turkeys per year. And then they're not all alive at one time because it's only 10 or 11 weeks old when they because they breed them to get so fat that they can't walk and they harvest them early. It's overwhelming. It's just insane. It's, it's overwhelming. Yeah, especially you, you, it's overwhelming, especially when we understand and it's now much more widely you know that this is taking us to a trajectory that unless we change it, it will cause the collapse of civilization. And it's, cost, it's going to cause the collapse of civilization, not by the end of the century, not in 2100. It will cause the collapse of civilization in the next 50 to 20 years. Or if you are optimistic, 30 years. I mean, what we're talking here, uh, the good news is the window of opportunity. There is a still a window of opportunity, but it's rapidly closing. And we don't have decades to put the work together. We have very, very few years, and that's why this becomes rather difficult for people to grasp. And this is why I think so many people prefer not to think about it and dis get distracted with something else. Because it why did you say that we're going to have a collapse of, of civilization possibly in the next 15 to 20 years? For what reason? Because most of, of the studies in terms of species, species extinction, on climate change, on pollution and so on, is getting us to a tipping point where pandemics like COVID, like loss of ecosystem services and so on, are becoming so big. And uh, the rate of change is much, much faster than we anticipated. So this is on top of oil depletion and um economic overshoot and finance and all that agricultural problems. Exactly. This is a site uh, we can have a collapse similar, a collapse related to economic issues or to political issues or to social issues. Talking about the environmental issues, there is the probability that in the next few decades there will be a collapse of civilization. But when people say this, the, the, the people say, Gerardo, that sounds like um, ridiculous. Just think about it. We have now a pandemic that has put us basically on our knees. And it, was the, it wasn't the worst virus and the worst the emerging disease that we have faced in the last uh, 50 years. Ebola is much worse. The Marburg virus is worse. The Lasha fever is worse. Anyway, right now, there are more than 2 billion people who don't have, don't have cleaning water. There are almost 2 billion or more than 2 billion people who don't have enough to eat next day or next in the next few weeks. There are 100 or 150 million ecological refugees, environmental refugees. So if you go to Kinshasa or so many of these, these places and you see the conditions that millions and millions of people are living right now, this is collapse. I mean, this is the, the definition of collapse. Well, if you're an elephant or an insect, you've also undergone a uh, collapse. Exactly. So, so obviously, all these species who are being driven to extinction by your activity are, are, are part of this collapse. That, that's a very important point that you mentioned. We are looking at the collapse 
of the natural systems that are essential for human survival. The animals, you know, that are being uh, disappearing are part of this collapse. The, the plants that are disappearing are part of this collapse. The massive losses of ecosystems are part of this collapse. And then the reflection of what I say of these problems on billions of people already, for me, this is already that we are entering in the collapse that just will become massive and global if we don't do something in the next few decades. But what I'm trying to say is that we, we cannot predict exactly when, but to say that it will be at the end of the century is probably responsible in the sense that it giving us a false sense of security because it's still 80 years. So I want to come back to this, but I had a thought while we were talking about chickens. I think there's a paradox in the human brain. I have chickens only for the eggs and for the companionship. I have 17 chickens and I love going out and sitting with them. And every night there's two of them, a rooster Floyd and Blanche, this hand that I stroke before I shut them in at night and I go, chip, 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 chip. And they're my friends and they're so interesting. They're dinosaurs. Yeah, that's a yes. And yet I eat chicken. I, I don't eat pork at all and I rarely eat beef, but I do eat chicken. So I'm just processing this in my brain, talking about the 70 billion chickens that humanity consumes. I consume some of those chickens and yet I love my chickens and I don't eat them. So what's going on there? And, and why are these two things happening in my brain? And what does that suggest for a greater consciousness? I, I don't know. I'll just ask you. Well, I don't know. But w what I know, it is basically excess on behaviors. The excess, I mean, it is perfectly right. I think it could be perfectly balanced if we eat a meat once a month or once every month. But when you eat everyday meat, or when you, as you we say, the excess on what we do mm -hmm. is what it causes the problem. I, I mean, if I have a house, if I have a, have a car, if I have, that's fine. If, for instance, I have to travel a lot and use planes, and I don't feel remorse because I know I causing, I am causing pollution, but I think it is much more important that I travel to say jaguars and big chunks of habitat and so on, than to stay in my home without flying. So basically the, the balance is that, I mean, we have to balance our act and what you're doing with your chickens and eating chicken, basically, I'm sure you are balancing that you're not eating. Well, it's, it's uh, what I teach my students. Uh, and we wrote in our book that the time now isn't to minimize your impact and be a smaller part of one eight billionth of the of the planet. It's to maximize your impact and do whatever you have to do and have a good moral, ethical, environmental hygiene and make good decisions, but try to be impactful at larger scales like you're doing with your work. That's exactly what I was trying to say. That's exactly yeah. what, for instance, if I stay home, I will reduce my impact, but I won't have any big impact. Exactly. Instance, we are having in Mexico, there is a project right now they call the Maya train is a project pushed by the government. And this government has been the more, the, the most anti-environment ever in Mexico since I, I was at a, a high school. Uh, regardless of that, I help the project. Once once was approved part of the project, I helped them to design in such a way that we created wildlife passes because the project was we will be done, you know. First of all, it was done and follow the law. So you may say philosophically, I don't like trains, or you may say politically, I hate this government, I don't like the train. But if it was done properly with the law, that's the right, they have the right to do it. And a train has much less impact than more highways and cars and so on. Anyway, we work with them and we create the largest project on the planet with wildlife passes. In uh, 700 kilometers, we managed to put 300 wildlife passes. Massive thing, you know? And, uh, and then they change the director and with a new one, it's a uh, really bad guy. It's really bad, it's, it's messing this up. So we're not working anymore with them, but I didn't close up my work for saving the forest in the Yucatan Peninsula because it's happening. So I go there often and we design a project where we are benefiting 
I don't know, probably 20,000 families, and we're saving right now uh, almost 700,000 acres directly by paying ecosystem services to the owners of the forest. And these are the ones I tell you that they are so proud. And when they have a little money, they are, that they are, have enough to live, they will be the first to defend their forest. And not only that, it occurred to me, how can we create a series of protected areas that we end up, we will end up with 3 million acres protected with the local people with the help or without the help of the government. So this is exactly what you said. While, while I have to work with the government and everybody was, I mean, the people close to, in, in favor of the government say that I was in favor of the train, the people against the train say that I was uh, betraying nature and all kinds of things. If I was guided by science and what was right, we did a really great impact. But as you say, this has to be guided by eth ethics and in terms when you're a scientist by the scientific knowledge that will help to minimize the impact of those projects and maximize what we can say. Excellent. I'm going to ask you more about your work in a minute, but I have a core question that I wanted to get to on this uh, conversation. Gerardo, what is a mass extinction and is a sixth mass extinction now inevitable? Well, in the last 700 million years, we have a, a good fossil record to be able to see three things in the history of uh, biodiversity, of life on Earth. One is that the balance between extinction and uh, speciation has been positive, so we have more species now than ever, as I said before. This is the first thing. Second, we have seen in this fossil record that there has been five times where suddenly the extinction rates become much, much higher than the speciation rates, causing the loss of most plants and animals on the planet. And, th and that's not a population extinction. That's the species itself goes extinct. That's the species. I mean, this massive loss of a species, 70% of all the species in the planet or more are, have become extinct. And then we know that it has co been caused by a catastrophe, natural catastrophe, like the meteorite that impacted the planet 66 million years ago. So we call them mass extinction. Then a mass extinction has three characteristics. One is ge geologically speaking really fast, hundreds of thousands or a few million years. Second, it is a uh, wipeout, 70% or more of all the plants and animals in the planet. And third, it was caused by a natural catastrophe. When we started to do our studies on extinction, that was exactly what I wanted to see. That if the rate of extinction that we're looking at now was similar to the rate of extinction in the last few million years or normal extinction, or it was elevated. Fortunately for us, you know, we saw that uh, Tony Barnowski, a colleague of mine from Berkeley, they published a paper where they gathered data from thousands and thousands and thousands of fossils and semi-fossil mammals, and they managed to determine that in the last few million years, the normal extinction rate was basically, you will expect one extinction for every 5,000 species in a century. In other words, you have, in those million years, you will pick up a century, and at that century, you have 10,000 species, you will expect two extinctions. If you have 40,000 species, you will expect eight extinctions. If you have only 5,000 species, you will expect one extinction. So that was... The background rate. That was the background rate. The background or normal rate, exactly. But for all, it was like gold, because basically, we have something to compare what's, what's going on. So we look at what's happened in the last 500, million, 500 years in terms of extinctions of vertebrates, and then what's happened in the last uh, 100 years, we're expecting things to be bad, but not as bad as we found it. Uh, we, as I say, we find that the species lost in the last 100 years will have lost in 10,000 years or more. So when we published this paper, it was published in Science Advances, we thought that we would get a lot of criticism. And uh, surprisingly, it wasn't. Actually, people were, did agree. And one of the criticisms that we have, it wasn't a criticism, but say, well, this is happening in vertebrates, and it's correct. It seems to be everything seems to be fine, but uh, it's not happening in other groups. And then after our paper was published, there started to be uh, papers published in other invertebrates, you know invertebrate plants and uh, even um, microorganisms and now it's clearly 
uh, been shown that we have entered the sigma max extinction. And you say that it's inevitable. It is probably inevitable if we really put our act together and we slow down the loss of populations and the loss of species, and we can restore a lot of the populations and the species who are on the brink of extinction. But uh, this has to be at a global scale, and it has to be, it's impossible to be done by actively protecting the places. It has to be done reducing the use of carbon and fossil fuels, and reduce, basically reducing the magnitude of the human enterprise so we can reduce pollution, toxification, habitat destruction, overkilling, and so on. So as far as the inevitability of a sixth mass extinction, uh, and I know this will you'll have to give me a speculative answer on this because no one knows, but what percentage of the risk of an actual mass extinction? And what was the exact definition? Like 70% or, or is, is there a threshold to be called a mass extinction? Yes. Well, I mean, this is kind of a standard, but, but yes, 70% of all the uh, species has to become extinct. Okay. And do you think that the biggest risk of that happening is climate change or is it 10 things all together or is climate change the real the real granddaddy of that risk? No, I think a species extinction is as bad as climate change, but it hasn't been understood, at the, I mean, just by itself. If we take out climate change and we continue with the problems of habitat destruction, uh, overkilling, diseases and so on. Pesticides, herbicides, all that. Pesticides, herbicides, we will face a, a six mass extinction. If, unfortunately, on top of us, we put climate change, that will mean that we will affect many more species much more rapidly, and that will be synergic and additive impacts, effects among all these issues. So this is why it's so complicated, so complex, and so overwhelming, because it basically involves all the human enterprise. Okay, here's a tough question, Gerardo. Do you think a collapse of human civilization would be good for animal and other species populations? Some people think definitely so, and others I've talked to think absolutely not. What do you think? Well, I would say in different way. First of all, what we have learned from all the past extinction, mass extinction, is that life has recovered. Completely different way things, completely different species. There are no more dinosaurs, there are no more trilobites, there are no, but life recovered. But it took 15 to 20 to more million years. So in other words, I feel somehow a little bit it's, it's less stress when I think that unless there is a nuclear holocaust or something like that, life will prevail, okay? Now, if a collapse of civilization is good or bad, it could be tremendously bad in the sense, and it could be tremendously bad and it could speed up the extinction crisis. Just imagine that suddenly, there is not enough food in the US and people has gone. What will happen with the wildlife? They will go and kill deer or kill whatever to feed and it will happen throughout the world. If you yeah. are in a, in a place in Africa and suddenly there is no more food, yeah. uh, you will go and kill the last elephant with no problem. So in that sense, it could be really, really bad. Yeah. And in the sense, if there's a hundred plus nuclear missiles and then there's nuclear winter and there's no photosynthetic productivity in the oceans, I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios like that, which is I'm trying to work on what I refer to as a bend, not break scenario. And I don't know exactly how that looks. Clearly, the, the sooner that we stop emitting carbon, the better certain populations will be uh, of organisms in the ocean, uh, for one thing. But yeah, it's a heavy question to, to even think about. So what are you do some work on endangered species, maybe talk a little bit about some of your biggest challenges and biggest successes on your own work? Yeah, well, what we do in my lab is basically basic science. And we do basic science, and really powerful science. But this is different from any labs in the planet, is that we, scientific labs, is that we do a lot of conservation in situ. So we go and work to save species, but also to save habitats, ecosystems. We have created 
almost two percent of the Mexican land mass is protected because of the work uh, that uh, we have been proposed to the government in these uh, in new areas of, as, as uh, national parks or uh, biosphere reserves and so on. And the other part is like uh, we, we work with uh, endangered species. For instance, we reintroduced bisons in Mexico, working with our colleagues. We created a reserve in other Mexico in the U.S. border, and this is a what we call, it's called Hanos Reserve, and in that we reintroduce bison, we are protecting the black-footed ferret, and the Mexican government has reintroduced the wolf. So, and in southern Mexico, we work with jaguars, we work with tapirs, monkeys, and so on, trying to save them. Are you connected with a lot of grassroots eco teams around the world that are working on on issues because of your your center node uh, nature in this topic? Uh, with some, not with many, but some, yes, um, because we are so unique in the sense that we do science and we also do this work. Huh? So we're not as, as uh, well connected in that sense with other groups. Simply we don't have enough time to do it, you know. But yes, we are part of some networks. And then what we, the other thing we do, so we, we propose and, and protect areas as, as a, a prote- a nature reserves. We work with endangered species, but we also do what we call public policy. We propose the first endangered species act in Mexico that now protects 3,000 species. And uh, we propose also we help to create a national commission on protected areas and so on. We create the first program for recovery of uh, prairie dogs and jaguars. So we go for, uh, and, then, and then we do a lot of outreach. We do a, a lot of work with uh, working with the local governments or local people and schools and so on, trying to uh, talk about these uh, issues, but also talking many times about the successes that we have. We have got a lot of success and although it is small, for the magnitude of the problem at the, at, in Mexico or in the planet, those successes are very important to talk about because gifts come to people and guidance. Well, we just we need orders of magnitude more people working or at least devoting some time and resources and effort and passion towards this issue. What are some ways that people listening to this program who care about other species in the natural world can make an impact globally or especially in their local ecosystems to help other creatures make it through the coming bottlenecks uh, of this century? Well, first of all, if they are uh, listening to this program, to your podcast, they are already doing something that is good. They are getting in good information. I would say that anything that can reduce our impact locally at home for instance, if we are more affluent and we can buy better soaps or better foods or use less plastic and so on, that's all good. If you go into the internet that put 50 ways to help the environment, you will find literally hundreds of pages that will guide you on what you can do. But for instance, never buy wildlife as pets, never eat wildlife for food, try to reduce your impact of eating a little, uh, for instance, I like uh, meat, and but I eat the meat uh, every, uh, probably once every two weeks or something like that, and before I used to eat it two, three days a week, and nothing changed. Actually, probably my health is a little bit better in some senses, but uh, I haven't lost my pleasure of sometimes eating meat. I just have to be more responsible how to eat it. We buy things here, in at home, a local thing. People, for instance, every Wednesday, a guy come and sell us their uh, fruits and the uh, uh, vegetables that he, they got from here. And in the ranch that we have, we do exactly the same. We, we, we grow a lot of our own legumes and fruits and so on. The other thing is to get involved locally and regionally. For instance, it's very important at this point, the people that you vote for has to have the right ideas in terms of protecting the environment, in terms of putting the proper uh, laws and the proper uh, norms to reduce our, our impact. And the other part, it is incredibly easier now to become, if you're interested, for instance, in saving a species, to become volunteer or to donate funds or to do something uh, to, to help the, the, the species that you are interested. Basically, what I said because these are not recipes, there are so many ways to do it. Basically, what we have to do is to become actors, instead of being spectators, really. And now with the social media and with the internet, we can really become 
actors in a big way locally, regionally, and globally? I think they're, my sense, and of course it could be my network, and so I'm biased, is a lot of people understand this, a lot of people care about it, but the barrier to entry is so high that they don't know what to do. They want to do something. And I think sometimes, you know my work about the superorganism and the energy-hungry entity that humanity en masse has created. It's, it's hard to fight that. But I think there are watersheds and communities and ecosystems around the world where people listening to this show live and you can get a start right there. It's just, how do you get started? I wish there was some international network with a how-to guide on protecting your local creatures and ecosystems. Does that exist? What do you, what do you recommend on, on that? Well, it, it does exist. And there are, as I said, uh, in the internet, in YouTube and so on, there are uh, many ways, many examples of what you could do. But probably, I mean get closer to people like me or you or to people or, or some of the NGOs who are doing a good work. It is hard, but it's not impossible. And the examples are now replicating. But you just give me a good idea that uh, maybe it would be good to, to have like a... Like a, a clearinghouse. A clearinghouse for that. And let me tell you something. I have been working with a new pro project. We call it First Stop Extinction. And I will call it Creatures United that uh, uh, if it works and we everything seems to be work, going in the right direction, it will be basically that. We, it will be a massive movement. We'll try to get the idea of a species extinction to two billion people in the next five years, specifically what is the problem, what is magnitude, what I can do, and then to, the, to direct their effort to basically four things what needs to, I mean, projects who are already working, saving species and ecosystems, then uh, a database who are already been built where you can click in your neighborhood and see what are the species and what the species are in danger. And basically, and the, the third part that we will be developed is we will be kind of the cleaning house. You say, okay, I am in Oaxaca, Mexico. I like to find out what are the groups who are working in different species. Huh? And you can click it and it will give you all the groups working there, and then you can go and search and decide which one you want to support. Creatures United. Creatures United. And the idea, it is very ambitious, is to be, to help to save 100 million hectares, 1 million species, and to reach probably between 2, 3 billion people in the next 10 years. And not only would that help those species and ecosystems, but it also gives uh, a sense of the sacred to those humans working on those things that we're lacking in our lives right now. That's exactly right. And it also will give, it, it will be like a solid ground to avoid many of the dangers of possible collapse. It's very ambitious. It's, it's going, it's coming along well. It has to be ambitious. So let me know if I can help you with that, Gerardo. I will. And we will launch on uh, November. And just to give you an idea, the idea is that we're, the, we call it Creatures United because these are animals dressed like humans. And it will say, for instance, hey, you, I am the white elephant, the white rhino. I'm becoming extinct. I need your help. I'm talking on the name of all these endangered species. We need your help. Please help us. Something like that. And then it will be show in the, we want it to be for two days, be on the, on, on the walls of the United Nations. You know that at night they put their colors or flags sometimes. We want to put the creatures there showing how many they are and where they are and why are they becoming extinct. Good luck with that. I, I sense that people already feel that this is happening and it's too painful to go there. So there ha it has to be coupled with direct action steps that sure. people can immediately do. Otherwise, it's too sad and, and overwhelming, I think. But you're right. I mean, here you can donate to pr projects who are already working and saving the species. You can participate in our project. It will tell you what kind of thing you can do, for instance, what product you can buy uh, reducing your impact. It will tell you what is the problem of uh, uh, um, 
uh, trade, uh, wildlife trade, and what can you do to avoid it, and so on. I, I think that's really important. I also do think we need people to find each other in communities in Topeka, Kansas, and Red Wing, Minnesota, and Toluca, um, Mexico, that find each other and actually try to restore the ecology and protect the species in their own watershed within five miles of their house, and to have a toolkit for that. And I don't know how possible that is. Well, I think about it. I read that somebody said that we need $400 billion to invest in conservation, and it will be enough to tip off the point. $400 billion a year is nothing in a trillion dollar economy. And what I say is just like if you have $1,000 in your pocket, and they say, oh, sir, I'm sorry, you have to spend $4, otherwise you're going to die. You will get it <laughs> right. immediately. You know what I'm saying? I well, mean, it's, I mean, that's why... I'm so impressed and thankful for people like you and Daniel Pauly and, and Peter Ward and others who are, because there's not a lot of funding to learn about all the other species that are, are we're sharing the planet with. So thank you. I, I have some questions that are a little personal that I asked to all my guests, if you don't mind. So Gerardo, you were an animal researcher expert, but you're also a college professor. So what do you tell your students after hearing about species extinction and future risk. Do you have any recommendations specifically for young humans listening to this show who are becoming aware of the economic, environmental risks and challenges we face? Well, what I say, first of all, that there is still time and there is still, we have a lot of responsibility, but also it's a great time of opportunity. So I say to them that they, the, the most uh, open mind they are and the better prepared, academically prepared they are, less focus on one thing and more broad their knowledge, they will be better. What I tell my students and the people that I uh, they take my classes is that they uh, uh, have to spend time understanding the market, understanding what are the places where people will need, uh, or that the society will need specialized people, and that they have to think how to put their uh, heart and their passion towards those places so they can have a decent job to do that. And I put myself as an example. When I was studying ecology, the ecology, the world wasn't even understood. And probably I was one of the first, probably 20 ecologists in the country, maybe less. I mean, and here I am. I'm well off and I'm happy and I do what I wanted to do. At that time, everybody would say, what I do, Gerardo, you are intelligent. Why do you study a lawyer or an accountant or something? You will money and then you'll be this as a, your hobby. And my father was very good. And he said, send them to hell. Do what you wanted to do. You took the right path, my friend. I think so. So what do you care most about in the world, Gerardo? To be honest, I care most species that are becoming extinct. I'm obsessed to save species. I mean, obviously my family, first, but aside from my family, the most important thing for me is what I do, trying to save things from extinction and make, in terms of my science, uh, the kind of thing I have done to be aware uh, and, and really understand the magnitude of the problems and then to expose them to as many people as I can, saving a species, saving habitat, it gives me so much, so much happiness. For instance, recently we, we signed the deal that we're saving these 700,000 acres of forest. Yes, incredibly, I'm very happy for the people who own that land, but I'm happy for the species who will be saved there. That's excellent. What are you most concerned about of all the things we've talked about in the coming decade or so in our world? Main concern is we don't do the changes that we need to do quickly enough so we can really stop uh, the problem and avoid a collapse of civilization. And this is both personally, I'm already enough that I have lived a plentiful life, but I'm worried about my children. I mean, they're only 30 years old. And if things go bad, they will be younger than I when they will feel the heat of the whole problem. So that's my main concern. And my main concern, sometimes I, I wonder, I mean, have we been so, I feel like we have failed in humanity the people like me who are working on this, and we haven't been able to turn the tide, you know? So I know this is not, a, it will be very 
suburb or very bad to think that we can have the power to change it. But sometimes I feel worried that we haven't been able to have a better impact, a much higher impact to change the tide. I, I feel it every day, Gerardo, that we're not doing enough, but we're, we're trying and we have to keep trying. Mm -hmm. uh, so in contrast to that, what are you most hopeful for in the coming decade or so? I'm very hopeful because I'm seeing changes, great changes. I see that there is so many people interested in what we do, in what I do, or in the environment and corporations, governments, a TV series talking about this. I think I'm hopeful, and at least in my mind, I imagine that we are, as I say, like in the 70s with all these revolutions, the minority, the women, the revolution, the uh, or in the in the late 1900s with evolution, geology, uh, psychology, and um, economics, and so on, that really shape up the following decade. And for many for many decades, we're perfectly fine. I mean, if we we will really live in a better world from from sometimes in the 60s and 70s, and then we lose the we lose the track. I agree with everything you just said, except for the uh, revolution in psychology and economics. Perhaps I might disagree with that, but we'll do that in another call. It was a revolution. It doesn't it doesn't mean that it was the proper revolution, but it changed things. The, the change yeah. that we you know. Yeah. No, you're right about that. So if you were benevolent dictator and there was no personal recourse to your decision, what one thing would you do to improve the human and planetary futures? Well, if I could do it, I would probably get the experts and find out ways how to reduce our appetite for fossil fuel and then take the decisions to curb it. On that note, uh, do you have any other closing thoughts, advice, or wisdom for our listeners? This has been a wide-ranging, very deep personal conversation, and I thank you. What, do you have any other closing thoughts? Well, what I would say is that I have devoted my life to work with animals to save species and so on, and I feel very grateful, and I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful that we together, we will be able to turn the tide and as I said before, fortunately, the window is still open. It's rapidly closing, but still open. And I don't want to, I, believe it or not, and I'm optimistic, I really think that we can, if we keep working hard, and we may change the fate of humanity and the fate of biodiversity. Thank you so much for this conversation and for your lifetime of work on these issues. And I hope to see you again soon, my friend. Thank you very much. It was being wonderful. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases.